Hey. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 39. We're your hosts, Kendall and Josh. Yes, we are. Back. Again. For a relatively <laughs> creepy episode for you today. What are relatively, we Relatively, it's very yeah. creepy. Like, buckle in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm trying not to scare people too much so they'll click away, but oh. it Ooh. is a uh, very intense podcast today. We're talking about perhaps one of the most notorious serial killers of all time, John Wayne Gacy, the real life killer clown. So if you're scared of clowns, then I'm sorry, this is going to be a uh, terrifying episode for you. But it should be very interesting as well. This guy is uh, uh, something else. I mean, I don't even know how to classify him, but he yeah. is just... It's a weird one, for sure. He's a very bizarre human being. Conundrum. Very sick individual. So <laughs> that is what we are talking about today. Uh, and also we have... Uh, some other few things I wanted to briefly mention before we jump in to today's episode. First of all, if you guys haven't checked out Mile Hard Merch, make sure you go check out the merch store that we have just opened about a few weeks ago. It is awesome. We're both repping our merch gear today. Oh, yeah, we are. With the podcast hoodie and the Third so Eye soft. Einstein shirt. So if you guys are interested in any of this kind of stuff and you want to support the show, support us directly. You can go to milehiremerch.com hey. and use the code LAUNCH for 20% yeah. off your order. Take advantage of it. It ends at the end of October. So Yes, only through October 31st. Also, Kendall has working, been working on her coloring book that she just came out mm -hmm. with. So if you haven't checked that out, Definitely highly recommend do. you take a look at that. This is available on Amazon for only $14.99 with free shipping if you have Prime. And it is awesome. I love this coloring book. I've already gone through so much of it. So I'm going to be coloring again today because I had so much fun doing it last time. And Josh and I were talking about how it actually really helps me um, concentrate to color. When I was in school, I used to like I had an IEP, um, which is like an individual education plan. So I was allowed to color or doodle in a lot right, of my which classes. makes total sense. I think it yeah. does actually help you. It does. Uh, stay engaged more with the actual show and things while we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about stuff. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, like, I mean, I got ADD. To look at other things. Yeah, exactly. What can you do? What can you I do? I don't take medicine for it. So, yes, <laughs> you can only do so much. I'm going to just color. That's We've also help. got our co host today, little Sadie, little Booch. the Havanese, with us. Oh, for yeah. those that are listening, she's sitting in between us. She's our little buddy now. But, um, and uh, also, if you're looking to just chill and relax while listening to the podcast, we highly recommend Hemp Bombs for all your CBD products and needs so definitely check out hemp bombs use the code mile higher and you'll get 20 percent off your entire order all right let's see here what's next also we want to thank all of our patrons as usual and also just thank all of you guys we hit a hundred thousand subscribers on yes! youtube yes yay that That's has crazy. been like my dream this whole time since the beginning was to just like yes. get a hundred thousand on a channel that I'm involved with. We get a on plaque. YouTube. So that's awesome. Yeah. 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 We'll put it in the in the new uh, studio when that's done. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just wanted to shout out uh, to the new stellar patrons, Jenny T and Minera A. Thank you guys so much. And this week's patron question comes from Maddie. In celebration of the legalization of marijuana in Canada. What kind of hurdles do you think we'll need to jump through to decriminalize a goddamn plant in each individual state? What kind of information will we need to disseminate in order for more folks in the conservative states to get on board? So mm. just to preface this question, uh, Canada is the second country in the world to legalize marijuana nationwide. So bravo wow. to them for... Just Seriously. doing the right thing and just going all out. Yeah, because other than uh, Canada, Uruguay is the only other uh, country that's nation or legalized marijuana nationwide. Wow. Uruguay, really? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I never would have guessed that. Random, right? Yeah. No, I know. So, yeah, they're the first country to legalize the production, sale, and consumption. So, well, I think the it's going to be discussion over time and you know, just the normalizing it slowly over time, like people like us talking about it. I am bringing um, CBD. I'm talking about CBD in my channel for the first time tomorrow on Talk Tuesday. You know, things like that. That's going to bring awareness to a lot of people. About. Absolutely. It's just going to it's going to require education and re-education since a lot of people are extremely misinformed about marijuana right. and what it is, what it does to you. Well, the majority of the people that are opposed to it are older folks. And the older folks are, you know, 
predisposed to the information that was given to them <laughs> as they were growing up and going through their teenage years, you know, really when the war on drugs really started. So a lot of them just are misinformed on, you know, the reality around marijuana, the medical benefits of it, mm -hmm. and just all of the, you know, really great things that come along with legalizing it. So I think to answer your question, Maddie, I think we just need to get the facts out there. Like we yeah. need to, you know, get campaigns going, really Inform spreading the word the and getting, you know, especially some of these more conservative states, the facts and things like that. But I don't even think marijuana is really that, you know, like a, much of a political issue. It's more of like a human issue in my, yeah. in my eyes. Like it shouldn't yeah. be like, you know, right or left or conservative. Oh, for sure not. I don't think it issue. really is because it's really one of those issues that a lot of people who are like independents or what's what's uh, libertarians, a lot of them are people that um, are like small government yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah. like keep your hands right. out of my shit. Right. And There's no your, reason. Don't you don't need to worry about what I'm, what plants I'm eating and using off of this planet when I live here. I'm sorry, but. It's so crazy. Josh and I were just talking about it over the weekend when we were in the mountains. Like, how dare anyone tell me not to use this when it is literally a plant off of my planet? The fact that the government's you know? telling us that we can't, you know, consume these plants that grow uh, you know, out of the ground. Make a decision for yourself. And, you know, make it. It's, it's the same thing with anything else the government tells you you can't do. I know. You know, especially when it comes to your individual freedoms and liberties. Like, there's no reason they should be you know, have their hand in something, especially something like marijuana that is relatively safe. So yeah, it's, it's really just ridiculous. And, you know, Justin Trudeau, um, bravo to him, you know, tweeted about it and was like pumped up about it and said that, you know, this is going to help, you know, it, because what, what legalizing, uh, marijuana does is it all of a sudden takes a huge or takes, you know, puts a huge gash in the illegal, uh, market for drugs and marijuana and things like that because now people don't have to go to you know some dealer mm -hmm. or somebody off the street where it could be dangerous and you don't know yeah. what you're getting and right. you know young kids are getting a hold of it much more easier you know what we are doing is regulating it and treating it and you know you got to have an id and everything like that like it's you know it's a very it's very much regulated mm -hmm. and you know like we've experienced here in colorado it's it's very safe you know it's heavily you know taxed and regulated so there's really nothing to worry about. And plus the tax dollars is generating billions of dollars in just Colorado alone. So this is going to be billions and billions of dollars being pumped back into the Canadian economy. That's incredible. And, you know, going Lucky to them. hopefully things like schools and public uh, projects, things like that. So there's a lot of good that can come from this. And I think people are more than happy to pay the tax dollars in order to, you know, use legal cannabis. So bravo yeah. to Canada. Yes. Um, you know, congratulations hopefully the to US all our gets Canadian their shit together friends. and falls after. But the second part of her question was, what state in the U.S. do you think is going to be the last to, to legalize? The um, last. Um, if it goes state by state. Like, I think eventually it's just going to be a nationwide, sweep, like, yeah. federal thing. But if it was state by state, what would be the last state? Uh, Maddie thinks it's Florida. Um, she thinks Florida would be really? the last one. She's a the law last, student in could Florida. Could be. It definitely could be. I think Texas. Yeah, probably Texas. Just because the land of Jeff Sessions, I don't know. There's a lot of people down there. I think it'll probably be a southern, whether it's Georgia or Arkansas, mm -hmm. Alabama, Louisiana, somewhere like that. I think might be the last. But where did where just took hemp? Someone just like banned CBD. Oh, uh, it was oil. like North Dakota, I think. It was someone random. Yeah, or Idaho. I want to. Say. Yeah, it was Iowa. Idaho. I think it was Idaho actually, or yeah. it was like one of those states up like, there. Really lame. Yeah, that's really stupid. Yeah, it's going so. the opposite direction. So but I do think Canada doing it is a big step for all of us. And one day we will hopefully catch up to them. Yeah. Hopefully we can be as cool as Canada one day. I forgot it wasn't legal here for a second because I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, good for Canada. They're finally joining us. And then I realized like, no, wait, it's, it's only legal where I live here in Colorado. Well, and some other places. But yeah, there's only nine states right now that That's have a legalized. That's so weird to me so normal here like it's so normal here you guys what's you have so no idea weird to me is that the district of columbia so washington dc is uh, allows recreational use Interesting. but yeah everywhere else it's not like donald trump could technically like consume marijuana <laughs> go smoke up and be okay because he's in washington dc but i wonder if you're allowed to do that when you're president though but the good thing is that there is over um 30 different states that have medical marijuana um right now so or at least some form of it so things are definitely trending in the right direction. And I think Canada is a big, a huge, you know, 
mm -hmm. booster for the rest of us. So I do too. That is great. Congrats, yeah. all of our Canadian fans out there. Oh, we hope you Canada. enjoy. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But speaking of countries, here's another interesting story that a lot of people probably didn't hear about, and that's that China plans to launch an artificial moon bright oh, enough to replace yeah. its city streetlights by 2020. Damn, dude, they that's are literally really crazy. creating an artificial moon. So Baba Vanga, the psychic that predicted all this stuff, she she predicted us creating fake suns, artificial suns. So that's kind dude, of interesting. They're on, they're on that track. First the moon, then the sun, then the stars. And then you got artificial night sky. That's well. What's the point of that? Well, the, their point is that they're trying to. Um, they are basically trying to replace all of their street lights with more of like a natural glow, but it's going to be Whoa. coming from an artificial moon. Oh, that's kind of brilliant. So it's going to be like a big illuminated so it'd be satellite good for the the planet. How cool would that be, though? Yeah, like, for and sure. It, I think it's going to actually look like the moon too. So it'll look like mm. we they have like a second moon. Dude, China would. But it's like way is, closer awesome. and really bright. Wow. Yeah. Well, they need it, dude. If the, if like anywhere needs it, it's China. Because it would help the environment, right? Yeah, that too. And they said that well, be... you could turn off other lights and right, other sources right, of light. Right, light pollution and things like that would go way down. Oh, light pollution too? So you could see the stars better? Uh, Actually, I don't know about that. It might kind of... You know, yeah. I think it's more to just like decrease the amount of electricity that they're yeah. using for like street lights and things like that. That's smart. But they're City saying lights, that yeah. this supposed moon satellite would be eight times brighter than the real moon. That's kind of weird. What if people like go crazy and like start thinking their brain starts thinking it's like daytime or something? Yeah. Because, how bright would that yeah, actually like, how be? That bright. seems like it'd be really bright. Yeah, that'd be really bright. Well, eight I guess in some of brighter? these Chinese cities, it's like daytime all the time just because of all the lights. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my God. That's so crazy. So they also said that they're going to send three total in the next four years. And they're going to make them from some type of reflective material like a mirror. And they're expected to orbit at 500 kilometers above the Earth and light up an area with a diameter of 10 to 80 uh, kilometers. So Interesting. Yeah. Wow, I'm, that's so really cool strange. things are happening, I swear. Yeah, like, like lately. We're like re really trying to figure out like how do we up the game here? How do yeah. we make our our civilizations more advanced mm -hmm. and and things like that so that that's really cool honestly yeah the future's looking really cool i mean if we just figure out how to you know fix the environment and you know really make a dent in global warming and all that and start reducing that that would be really cool if we could figure out a way to do that like in one fell swoop yeah it would be that'd be extremely useful and you know what also is extremely useful is our first sponsor for today and that's the morning recovery drink. So remember if you're, you remember a few years ago when you could go out, have a few drinks and bounce back the next morning like nothing happened. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when we were young. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, yeah. friends. <laughs> and there's a new way to help you bounce back just like the good old days. And that's the morning recovery drink. It's engineered to help your body detox and rehydrate after drinking. All you got to do is drink one morning recovery drink before you go to bed to help your body detox, rehydrate, and bounce back so that you can be your fuller self and do more the next day, which uh, that's the thing, right? You know, if you go and get drunk, it's always the next day that is yeah. rough. Yeah, you've just like screwed yourself. Suffer. Yeah, totally. Well, this drink was designed by an ex-Tesla engineer and world-class wow. scientist. Wow, really? So super duper... Uh, smart people working on this. Yeah. And they combine the latest research and best ingredients to boost your liver's natural ability to break down alcohol. Genius. Oh, interesting. So the secret to morning recovery is DHM, a plant-based superhero ingredient shown to help accelerate the decomposition of toxins in your liver. And the drink tastes great. It has sold over 1.5 million bottles, and if you don't love it, you get your money back. So there's no reason to not try morning recovery drink and they have a special deal for you guys. All you got to do is go to morningrecoverydrink.com slash mile higher for 20% off your entire order. Oh damn! Get 20% off your entire order on a six pack, 12 pack, 24 pack, or if you're really fucking crazy, yeah, depending on 84 how hard you go. party pack. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> if you're going out every day, you got to Hey, the, if you're taking like a crew to Vegas or something, you've got a 12 smart, pack. Yeah. Yeah, if you're looking to party hard for Dude, a few Vegas days. Vegas for sure. Yeah, especially if you're looking to like party two days in a row. 
It's really you smart. need to like recover before the next round. Just every night, everyone's <laughs> drinking their drinks. That's probably so much better for you. Yeah, it I is. I bet it's, it like helps your body so much. It's a much. natural thing yeah. too. So cool. So yeah, get twenty percent off your order. Go to morningrecoverydrink.com slash mile higher. Sweet. All right. I don't know if you guys are ready for this. This this guy is fucking crazy. And are we going there? Yeah, we already <laughs> we're, ready. We're getting right mm. into it. We got a lot to cover as far as this uh, Mr. Gacy goes. Um, the real life killer clown. I don't know if any of you out there are scared of clowns or have been creeped out by clowns. I'm sure at least one of them are. Time. They're I, I definitely have been kind of creeped out from them from a young age. I feel Your like. Your brother is really afraid My of clowns. My brother is absolutely terrified yeah. of of clowns i've always known people in my <laughs> life like friends that were like scared of clowns i was never i never watched scary movies so i was never that like afraid of them yeah no so he the reason why he's the killer clown is because part of his whole you know life story as we'll as we'll get into is that in his sort of you know during part of his life he actually would dress up as a clown for like kids birthday parties charity events uh, go out in public just dressed up as this clown and the thing about it is that it wasn't just like a smiley happy clown look it's a very creepy fucking clown look like yeah it really was he used really sharp lines on the mouth and stuff so it looks like it just reminds me of like pennywise from yeah from it or he definitely looked like he was trying to be scary not right cute. yeah totally so i'm curious i don't think it's said in the thing i watched but did he was he employed to be a clown or was he just being a clown for fun? No, he was like being like I think he was being like booked for events and things like okay, he went so to like he was charities. Like legit clown. And, he was a legit clown, yeah. Freaky. Which Even is freakier. Weird. Cause what's so fucking crazy about this guy is that he is responsible for thirty three young men um men's lives. I mean, he took them from them and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that more, but he is definitely one of the most prolific serial killers in American history for sure, if not the entire world. Yeah, this guy, it's interesting. I didn't know this, but he he has like the most confirmed kills or one of the most yeah, confirmed kills. Yeah, I'm trying to kills. think if that still stands today. I think it does as mm -hmm. far as like- As far as serial killer. But yeah, as far as like victim count that they actually found and right. can confirm that like tied to him, yeah. it's the most like- because like H.H. H. Holmes, he's tied with some people else, think but... it was like 200 something, well, but yeah, they never but... found bodies. So right. I think they only confirmed like 19 of his. Right. Well, because I think they have to go something. based upon like how many people were last, in his case, yeah. last seen it in his hotel, yeah. his hotel of horror. That fucking creep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a whole nother thing. So we wanted to bring you guys an extra spooky episode for the month of October with Halloween around the corner. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, grab a drink, uh, maybe, uh. Grab a change of uh, drawers and let's, oh get, my God. let's get into it. If it's that scary, I'm a leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. I, I'll try to make it a little more upbeat for you. Okay, I'll it's try. not going to be I'll that try. scary, please. Okay. All right. I'll try to to make it not so scary. All right. So John Wayne Gacy Jr. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, on March 17, 1942, on St. Patrick's Day. The that fucker was. <laughs> that fucker was. <laughs> of course, he was born on St. Patrick's Day. But he was the second of three children and the only son born to John Stanley Gacy Sr., an auto repair machinist and World War I veteran, and his wife and mother, Marion Elaine Robinson, who is just a stay-at-home mom. Gacy was of Polish and Danish ancestry. His paternal grandparents had immigrated to the United States from Poland. As a child, Gacy was overweight, and he remained overweight for pretty much his entire life. He's a chunky guy. He's not, you know, athletic or, you know, small by any means but growing up he was close to his two sisters and his mother but endured a difficult relationship with his father who was an alcoholic and physically abused his wife and children throughout his childhood gacy strove to make his very strict father proud of him but seldom received approval from him and this constant friction with his father throughout his childhood and adolescence had a severe impact on him which is something that's very interesting I think we find with a lot of different serial killers, especially, um, is this mm -hmm. childhood. You go look at their childhood, and it's filled with you know abuse from their parents, it's or almost sexual always the assault too. and abuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's always it just seems like it's the father. Although the mothers, you know, like with the Fred and Rose West, like looking at the father and the mother both. Yeah, you know, but it was still father. 
Um, but yeah, normally they've definitely had some type of abuse, which brings back the whole question of is someone born evil? Like, was this right. guy born this way? Would he have been like this if he wasn't abused? Or Who raised knows? by different parents or in a different situation? I really think some people are born evil, though, because I I know of serial killers. Um, the guy, had, I can't like, think of the name of stuff. him right now, but yeah, he was like, like his parents loved him and he was... They would give him everything, and he was really spoiled. This, yeah, I think I've guy. seen that too. Absolutely, it's for um, the guy who killed Gianni Versace. He's a uh, serial killer. Um, I, yeah, you know, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And some people really are just born. It evil. goes back to, but how and why and what causes them? You know, like maybe it's maybe that's just where they're at in their you know soul's journey, or they're really you know, yeah, they need to do this in order to learn something, or like. Because if you think about it, like if you believe in that they're maybe born, you know, evil, then you start to think like, well, maybe there's a purpose, a predetermined purpose in life for everybody and everybody is, you know, sort of a fate or destiny. And, you know, even though some people die young and things like that, maybe it's a part of their journey ultimately. Yeah. Through but their soul's life. journey. Right. Their soul's journey. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting point that you brought up. But. One of Gacy's earliest childhood memories was of his father beating him with a leather belt at the age of four for just accidentally uh, disarranging car engine components that his father had assembled. On another occasion, his father struck him across the head with a broomstick, which left him unconscious. His father uh, regularly belittled him and often compared him unfavorably unfavor with his sisters and often accusing him of being dumb and stupid. So basically just a piece of shit dad that didn't like his son for some reason maybe you know i because like i think he because he was a world war one veteran that might he might have ptsd yeah, might have had some probably. trauma there Probably and maybe he didn't think his son like i think the whole gist of his childhood is that his father didn't think he was like manly enough you know mm -hmm. or like as much like you know what i mean tough, tough. as tough as yeah. he should be because he was kind of i think he was kind of a softer softer guy yeah and so this had a horrible impact on his self-esteem and Gacy regularly commented about how he was never good enough in his father's eyes um, all the way up until even after he was eventually arrested. And when he was six years old, Gacy stole a toy truck from a neighborhood store and his mother made him walk back to the store to return the toy and apologize to the owners. His mother told his father who beat Gacy with a belt as punishment. Damn. Yeah. Brutal, man. And after this incident, Gacy's mother attempted to shield her son from his father's verbal and physical abuse, yet this only succeeded in Gacy earning uh, accusations that he was a sissy and a mama's boy and would probably grow up a queer. So that was that goes right to my point that I think his dad kind of sensed that maybe his son was gay or, mm. you know, just had this yeah. disgust for him for not being as tough and manly as he probably wanted his he son to be. He probably was sensing that he was gay for sure. And I'm sure he said some nasty things oh, yeah. about regarding that. So as a young kid, that's going to totally destroy yeah. you. And I mean, I'm sure there's maybe some of someone out there that has experienced this and the had this type rejection. of childhood where, you know, yeah, rejection from your parents. Yeah. So Gacy's father was informed in 1949 that his son and another boy had been caught sexually fondling a young girl. Oh, yeah. And because of this, uh, his father whipped him with a razor strap as punishment. And then that same year, Gacy was molested by a family friend. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. That's who was a contractor who would take Gacy for rides in his truck and then fondle him. Oh, that's horrible. Well, that's probably a huge part of what Absolutely. Happened. I mean, who knows if he would have even gone on to do everything he did in his life if, if he, he didn't right. get molested. Absolutely. That's like such a huge, huge part of this problem. Absolutely. And he never told his dad about this because he obviously knew, fuck, yeah. I'm going to get beaten for this because his dad's it's not like going to believe him. Or, yeah, or exactly. He's going to be like, yeah. yeah. Sinning. Exactly. And because of a heart condition, Gacy was ordered to avoid all sports at school. And he was an average student with a few friends. He was an occasional target for bullying by neighborhood children and classmates. And he was known to assist the school truancy officer and volunteer to run errands for teachers and neighbors. During the fourth grade, Gacy began to experience blackouts. He was occasionally hop hospitalized because of these seizures and also in 1957 for a appendix that burst. So bad luck too, just yeah, like health-wise. And one thing I think is important to note is like growing up, 
like he definitely isn't like evil all the way around like mm -hmm. he definitely has like a human side that's like mm -hmm. very caring and he does you know he obviously cares about other even people. as an adult he seems to have still that. have this like Weird human empathy. side yeah empathy side which is not something you always see from a killer which is interesting yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah it is interesting so gacy later estimated that he spent almost a year in the hospital for all these episodes he had between the ages of 14 and 18 which attributed to the decline in his grades while he was in the hospital his father suspected the episodes were an effort to gain sympathy and attention mm -hmm. he openly accused his son of faking the condition as his son laid in the hospital bed, oh my God. literally come in and be Poor like, guy. "Stop faking it," That's and he's horrible. like, "Dude, my like my appendix burst. I'm literally passing out." Is he stupid? You can't fake your appendix bursting. Yeah. <laughs> so, and obviously, this was just his father, his mothers and sisters, and close friends never doubted his illness, and his condition was actually never conclusively diagnosed either. One of his high school friends uh, remembered several instances where Gacy Sr. ridiculed and then beat his son without um, provoking him. It's crazy. On one occasion in 1957, the same friend witnessed an incident at the Gacy household in which Gacy's father began shouting at his son for no reason, and then he began hitting him. Gacy's mother attempted to intervene, and then the friend recalled that Gacy simply put up his hands in defense adding that he never struck his father back during these physical alterations altercations altercations yeah so not a he's not like a you know violent person like you would think you know somebody that was like truly evil from birth mm -hmm. would like be fighting back and be like i'm gonna kill my dad i'm gonna murder yeah. him. you know like the fact that he You're never scared. showed that side though like yeah so maybe he wasn't evil from birth like maybe no definitely was, you know i think i don't think he is i don't think he was but I don't think that's the case with every killer is what I'm saying. Yeah. No, I got you. I got you. So in 1960, at the age of 18, Gacy became involved in politics, working as an assistant precinct captain for a Democratic Party candidate in his neighborhood. This decision earned more criticism from his father, of course, who accused his son of being a patsy or basically a fool. Gacy later speculated the decision may have been an attempt to seek his uh, the acceptance from others that he never received from his father, which would make sense. You know, mm -hmm. he goes out to the public to try to seek, you know, attention and acceptance. And actually that same year, Gacy became a Democratic Party candidate. Interesting. His father bought him a car with the title of the vehicle being in his father's name until Gacy had completed the monthly repayments. On one occasion in 1962, Gacy bought an extra set of keys after his father confiscated the original set. In response, his father removed the distributor cap, distributor cap from the vehicle, withholding the component for three days. Gacy recalled that as a result of this incident, he felt totally sick and drained. When his father replaced the distributor cap, Gacy left the family home and drove to Las Vegas, Nevada, where he found work within the ambulance service before he was transferred to work as a mortuary attendant, which mm, is interesting. Yeah. Which this is where it's like, maybe he starts like mm. getting some exposure to death and mm -hmm. things like that mm -hmm. obviously he's a mortuary attendant so obviously he had a curiosity about like human anatomy and stuff if he was like doing this kind of stuff yeah exactly i think he was obviously curious about the human body and you know as mm -hmm. we'll see here in a sec because he worked in this role for three months before returning to chicago during his time as a mortuary attendant gacy slept in a cot behind the embalming room and in this role, he observed morticians embalming dead bodies and later confessed that on one evening while alone, he had climbed into the coffin Ugh. of a deceased teenage male, Ugh. embracing and caressing the body before experiencing a sense of shock and disgust. Oh, what the fuck? That's, That's just so creepy. creepy. He slept near it. He like got in and climbed in and like hugged it like, yeah but he slept near the body in bombing room he like slept what did it say in behind it or something that's so creepy who would want to sleep near that yeah i think he was also like the janitor too so like he would oh, sleep there at night so and... fucking weird but the well, fact that the fact that he said he killer. did that i mean who knows if he really actually did that but that's fucking that's freaky i'm sure he did i'm sure he did weirder things if that's just what he said he did yeah oh, that's so creepy 
Oh, that's really freaky to think about. Like anyone can work in one of those, and like who knows what they could like do to you. I just body. understand like <laughs> how anyone in any mindset would feel like it's okay to do that. Like, yeah. Well, some I think some people out there like d just see it as like, well, they're dead, so what does it matter? Right. It's not going to affect like it's anyone. Gonna hurt them anymore. They than don't like see how that's morally wrong or like right. why that's clearly weird that's, to do. That's him. It's like missing that moral compass of death. Right. Like, under respecting the dead. Right. Yeah, that's crazy. But this sense of shock that he experienced from this prompted him to call his mother the next day and ask whether his father would allow him to return home. His father agreed in the same day. Gacy drove back to live with his family in Chicago. And upon his return, despite the fact that he had failed to graduate from high school, Gacy successfully enrolled in the Northwestern Business College, from which he graduated in 1963. And then from there, he took a management training position within the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. And I heard a thing, too, that he was actually, like, pretty, like, fairly intelligent. Like, his IQ score, I think, um, was, like, 113 or something, which is is not too bad. So it's not like he wasn't, really like, he wasn't, like, stupid or anything. Like, mm -hmm. he wasn't, like, you know, below average intelligence wise so and then in 1964 the shoe company transferred gacy to springfield to work as a salesman he was eventually promoted to manager of his department so he's a functioning human that knows and actually pretty uh business savvy and in march of that year he actually became engaged to his first wife marilyn myers a co-worker in the department that he managed spicy <laughs> spicy <laughs> after a nine-month courtship the couple married in september 1964 Probably didn't tell her about that uh, embalming episode, huh? <laughs> Just so you Clearly. know, one time I like hopped into <sighs> a coffin with someone. Yeah, I don't think he would have ever got married ever yeah. if somebody knew that. I'd be like, mm, okay. <laughs> That's, That's not odd. creepy. It's kind of odd, but I guess it's okay. <laughs> but his fiance's father uh, purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa, and Gacy and his wife moved to Waterloo so that he could manage the restaurants with the understanding that they would move into Marilyn parents' home, which they had actually left for the newlywed couple. And during his courtship with Marilyn, Gacy joined the local JCs, which is like a social club. Like and yeah, it's kind religious. of like a, uh, no, I don't think so. I think oh, it's, I thought maybe it stood for like Jesus Christ or something. Oh man. Now you got, now I got to know JCs social club. Is it religious? Oh, like I don't know if it's religious or not. Ugh, fuck. What is it? I don't think it's religious. It says it's just a social club, I'm pretty sure. Non-profit, non-government. I think it's more of like a business club. I'm pretty sure it's more of like a business social club. I don't think it's religious. Right. So he joined this and became, um, worked really hard for it, and, and they actually named him the key man for the organization in April 1964. And that same year, Gacy had his second homosexual experience. According to Gacy, he reluctantly gave in to this incident after one of his colleagues in the Springfield JCs tempted him with drinks and invited him to spend the evening on his sofa. The colleague then performed oral sex upon him while he was drunk. Interesting. So, so that's just according to him, too. Right. Like, who knows what right. Right, that's very true. And but it's just it's weird that like he's he's getting married or he's married to Marilyn, yeah. like and then right as he does that, he's like, you know, having a homosexual experience at the same time. Which I'm like, whatever, but you know, I'm sure Marilyn doesn't know about this and you know mm -mm. probably wouldn't like that too much. But he was probably like feeling the pressure, like he's like, I can't be who I want to be. So like he it was just I think kind he of Marilyn like was like his it, beard, yeah. you know? Yeah. Just covering up so that he could not be seen as strange by his dad or whoever was gonna judge him. Well he clearly, he was clearly like, wanted like to having make... different feelings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean he's he's self professed bisexual is what he says. He says he's not gay, he's not homosexual, but he he was <laughs> bisexual. That sounds about right for him though. I think yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think he did you know he obviously was leading this double life much like the golden state killer you know yeah how he was literally living two lives um i think a lot of killers do that they have to live like double lives you know they have the real real side of them that's like evil and they're a killer mm -hmm. and you know 
and they then, have yeah. all these crazy sexual uh experiences and things like that but then they're like just like the normal typical you know nine mm-hmm. to five guy with his family and kids you know it's yep, so it's, crazy yeah, it is it's just crazy that people can successfully pull that off without anybody you know catching on to them mm-hmm. so by 1965 gacy had risen to the position of vice president of the springfield jc's he was later named as the third most outstanding JC within the state of Illinois. So he clearly cared about the JCs and felt like, you know, he was getting somewhere with that um, organization. And then in 1966, Gacy began to manage the three KFC restaurants in Waterloo that his father-in-law had purchased. The offer was lucrative. Gacy would receive 15000 per year, which is equivalent to 115000 uh, as of 2018, wow. plus a share of profits earned uh, by these restaurants. So that's yeah. a pretty good deal. Yeah, that's a, not a bad deal. Yeah, I mean, got set up pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, 15000 a year back in 1966, that's that's a pretty good deal. Wow, inflation's so, is like crazy. Oh, yeah. Much. It's, it's so much higher now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and it just keeps going up and up yeah. and up. Yeah, it's what, where will it be when we're old, you know? I always keep so. track of it with movie tickets, like how much a movie ticket is. I keep track of it from cheeseburgers. I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> I just remember when I first started going to the movies, it was only like seven fifty or something, or like seven twenty five. Now it's like twelve or like something. eleven or twelve bucks. I think. Crazy. Yeah, inflation anyway. sucks. Yeah, but Gacy obviously accepted this job offer from his father in law and relocated to Waterloo, Iowa, with his wife later that year. In Waterloo, Gacy joined the local chapter of the JCs, of course, regularly offering extended hours to the organization in addition to 12 and 14 hour days. He worked managing three restaurants. Although considered ambitious and something of a braggart by his colleagues in the JCs, he was highly regarded as a worker on several fundraising projects. I think that's part of what they do too, is they like do fundraising and and charity work and things like that. And in the Waterloo JCs, he was the named the outstanding vice president and he would often provide free fried chicken to his colleagues and insisted upon being given the nickname the colonel damn so life's pretty good for him i mean he's he's kind of killing it so (laughs) that was a weird (laughs) thing to say he's gotta kill oh no pun intended oh yeah yeah that was weird yeah (laughs) (laughs) so he's busy being chicken man right now yeah it's like breaking bad man yeah i was about to say it reminds me of the guy from el pollo or whatever it's called what's it called uh la pollo i think Uh, is it la pollo no i think i don't know el pollo la pollo great show by the way so when does his life start going like crazy then it starts getting crazy very soon and uh we're getting there so gacy's wife gave birth to two children a son named michael who was born in february 1966 followed by a daughter named christine in march 1967 gacy himself later described this period of his life as quote unquote perfect he hmm. finally earned the long sought approval of his father at this point too. Oh wow! So he, he felt was like, like proud of his, him for being a right. dad and stuff. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Apparently, he actually went back to Iowa and visited with his father, and basically, his father said, "Son, I was wrong about you," and was actually somewhat proud of him. Interesting. Which is interesting. Oh. Yeah. What's wrong about you? But what's interesting about this JC group, especially in Waterloo, is that. Um, they were involved with wife swapping, prostitution, pornography, and drug use. Oh, that's weird. So there was like this dark side to the organization that nobody really knew about except for Gacy and some of his colleagues. Oh, so that's why he liked it so mm-hmm. much. He was deeply involved with these activities and regularly cheated on his wife with local prostitutes. Good job. He is also known to have opened a quote unquote club in his basement a where he club. allowed his employees to drink alcohol and play pool employees of what of his chicken restaurants oh of the chick oh okay which was teenagers so he was like come to my cool lounge place yeah he was like basement. come on come over i'll hook you up with drinks and drugs and we'll have a good old time oh, that's so freaky what a weirdo he would invite both sexes but he only socialized with his young male employees many were given alcohol before gacy made sexual advances toward them which if refused he would claim were just jokes or test of morals. So if they like kind of like refused him, he, he would just like kind of laugh it off and be like, oh, I'm just I'm fucking with you, joking around. Hmm. So that's that's kind of where things began. Now let's get into first victims. 
of John Wayne Gacy. So in August of 1967, Gacy committed his first known sexual assault upon a teenage boy. The victim was a 15-year-old named Donald Voorhees, who was the son of a fellow J.C. Oh, geez. Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah, seriously, right? Why would you do that to like someone on your little team? Your yeah, little that's squad? so fucked up. Probably because, I mean, who knows? Maybe he thought the whole time, like, maybe I'll get victims if I join oh, this group. Like, yeah. maybe this was all plans. Like, it could be. Yeah. How premeditated was he? Yeah. Well, it seems like he was pretty premeditated because he actually lured this uh, 15 year old boy, Donald, to his house with the promise of showing him porno films. Mm. And then he tempted him with alcohol and persuaded him to perform oral sex upon him. And over the following months, several other youths were sexually abused in a similar manner, including one whom Gacy encouraged to have sex with his own wife oh before blackmailing the youth into performing oral sex on him. Jeez. Yeah. It's this gross. is where this is where like his mind just starts getting really fucking twisted. Yeah. He also tricked several teenagers into believing he was commissioned with conducting homosexual experiments in the interest of scientific research. Wow, interesting. So he would literally give these guys, he'd be like, I'm going to give you 50 bucks if we do this, you know, homosexual act. Because it's for, for scientific science. research. There's no like, which is like, oh, wow. Interesting. Which 50 bucks too back then is a yeah, lot of a money. Lot. So like, he yeah. totally took advantage of these guys. Totally. And, you know, they're like, I guess if this is, you know, they're pro just young kids, you know? Yeah. In March 1968, uh, Donald reported to his father that Gacy had sexually assaulted him and his father immediately informed the police and Gacy was arrested and sub subse subsequently subsequently charged with oral sodomy in relation to Donald and the attempted assault of another teenager, 16 year old Edward Lynch. Gacy adamantly denied these charges and demanded to take a polygraph test. This request was granted, although the results indicated Gacy was extremely nervous when he denied any wrongdoing in relation to either of these two boys. What's interesting about him is when he denies that he did something, he seems to really believe it. Yeah. Like you never can tell if he like even actually knows what he's done because right. he seems to actually think he's innocent in a lot of these things. Sociopath. Enough to take a polygraph test. Yeah. That's something yeah. that they he would was do because like he's like, I'm innocent. He's like, I'm calm. Like he yeah. believes he didn't do these things. So is he like blacking out and doing them or did he like, I don't know. Did he really believe it or was he just like, maybe if I lie hard enough, they'll just believe well, me? Well, that's the, that's the whole debate, right? The whole yeah. debate is whether or not like, he no. knowingly knows that he knowingly knows. He, he knowingly thinks that he's, you know, mm -hmm. innocent or this is all just a part of, he's like a mastermind, evil master. Just a manipulator, yeah. Right, a master manipulator. Mm -hmm. And this is all how he gets away with it. What's crazy about this is that several fellow JCs found Gacy's story, story credible and rallied to his support. Wow. So basically he's backed him up and was like, there's no way he did this. This is crazy. Because when he talks, he's very convincing. Yeah. I bet a lot of his friends were like really persuaded by him. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah, like even knowing what he did, I still was kind of like intrigued by what he was saying in like interviews and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. He's very... You know, he definitely could convince you of pretty much anything, I think. Mm -hmm. So, the judge did not believe uh, his story. And he was indicted on the sodomy charge on May 10th, 1968. On August 30th, 1968, Gacy persuaded one of his employees, 18-year-old named Russell Schroeder, to physically assault Donald in an effort to discourage the boy from testifying against him at the upcoming trial. Oh, that's horrible. Schroeder agreed to lure Voorhees to a secluded spot, spray mace in his face, and beat him. My God. Gacy promised to pay him 300 bucks if he followed through. Probably didn't. In early September, Schroeder lured Voorhees to an isolated county park, sprayed mace supplied by Gacy into the boy's eyes, then beat him, all the while shouting that he was not to testify against Gacy at the upcoming trial. Damn. Luckily, Donald escaped and immediately reported the assault to the police, Good. identifying Schroeder as the attacker. Which Schroeder was arrested the following day, despite initially denying any involvement. He then soon confessed to assaulting Donald, indicating they had done so at Gacy's request. Mm -hmm. Gacy was arrested and additionally charged in relation to hiring Schroeder to assault and intimidate Voorhees. So 
back-to-back things he's getting hit with. Now he's getting arrested and getting an additional charge for basically hiring somebody to assault a witness. Damn. And because of this, on September 12th, Gacy was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation at the Psychiatric Hospital of the State University of Iowa. Two doctors examined Gacy over a period of 17 days before concluding that he had an antisocial personality disorder. Yeah, no shit. So well, that's so like uh, sociopath. That's a sociopath. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Shane Dawson, for teaching yeah. me. Or maybe even a psychopath, and was unlikely to benefit from any therapy or medical treatment, and that his behavior pattern was likely to bring him into repeated conflict with society. Interesting. They also conclu- concluded he was mentally competent to stand trial. So, upon advice from his attorney, Gacy entered a plea of guilty to one count of sodomy in relation to the charges filed against him by Donald. He pleaded not guilty to the other charges, which the other youth had basically levied against him during his formal arraignment on November 7, 1968. Before the judge, Gacy had said that he and Voorhees had indeed engaged in sexual relations, yet he insisted Donald had offered his sexual services to him and that he had acted out of curiosity. So that basically it was consensual. And his story was not believed. Despite his lawyer's recommendations for probation, Gacy was convicted of sodomy on December 3rd, 1968 and sentenced to 10 years at Anamosa State Penitentiary. On the day that Gacy was convicted and sentenced, his wife filed for divorce, which... Good for her. Yeah. Get the fuck out of there, Seriously. Lady. And she basically like she's alive. Yeah, took the couple's home, property, and sole custody of their two children. The court obviously ruled in favor of the divorce, and Gacy never saw his first wife or children again. Wow, really? He yeah, just they just gave up. they just completely blocked him, or they just completely blocked him out. Yeah. Which well, yeah. I mean, the guy's like literally a pedophile, like. You know, yeah, you would probably want to distance yourself from, yeah, you know, that's just even not if it safe. is your husband or father, like, good God. Yeah. So during his incarceration at the Anamosa State Penitentiary, Gacy rapidly acquired a reputation as a model prisoner. So the fact that he's able to, like, kind of, like, flip yeah. a switch and go from, he like, is. one, you know, like, he's been described as, like, Dr. Jekyll and, and uh, Mr. Jekyll and, Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like, he can be, like one and then he can be the other yeah and he really can it's amazing like what if you after this or maybe if you've already seen him definitely look up some clips of his him being interviewed because it's amazing how this guy can like flip and like truly he's so convincing yeah it really and he is. can he's almost be like likable too he can almost yeah. come across as a or like you kind of feel sorry for him yeah yeah it's more yeah it's more of like you kind of feel bad for the guy like yeah it's very strange and he does a really good job at like defending himself mm-hmm. and, like, and denying things. Very good manipulator for sure. Yeah. And can deny things without like letting on. Like he's just like seems convincing, even though you know he's full of shit. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely an interesting guy. He can control his emotions really well, too. Yeah. What's his sign? I don't know. You should look it up. Yeah. Or it's March 17th, so he'd be, uh, what? Uh, um, he would be... Blanking. Uh, what's that sign? He March 17th. He would be a Aquarius. Aquarius? Or Pisces. I'm Pisces. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a Pisces, yeah. Yes. Pisces? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I couldn't... He's, like, right on the Aries Pisces. Cup. Yeah, I was going to say, he's on a cusp for sure. But... While he was in Pisces uh, would make sense for him. I was guessing I was guessing cancer or some type of water sign just because of his emotions. He doesn't really have them though. But he seems like just like the way he He's a sensitive guy. He's sensitive. That's what I'm saying. But he doesn't he doesn't Pisces like are wear known any for being really, really sleeve. sensitive. Yeah. Well they can be they can hide their emotions for sure, but they're emotional inside. Right. Right. Emotionally damaged. Yeah. But he did really well in uh prison. He, he mm-hmm. rose to the position of head cook. He also joined the inmate JC chapter and increased their membership figure from 50 to 650 in the span of fewer than 18 months. Wow. He also helped increase inmates' daily pay. Uh, he supervised several projects to improve conditions. And on one occasion, Gacy oversaw the installation of a miniature golf course in the prison recreation yard. They have miniature oh, golf in prison. That's, that's pretty cool. Pretty nice. Yeah. 
And then in June 1969, Gacy first applied to the state of Iowa Board of Parole for early release. This application was denied. Sorry. In preparation for a second scheduled parole hearing in May 1970, Gacy completed 16 high school courses for which he obtained his diploma. What do people do if they're like sick when they're on a podcast? I feel like I have a little cold and I'm like sniffly and sneezing. Just stay away from the mic. <laughs> I'm trying to, but this mic's like so good it picks up everything. I know. I need I need to get make sure it's mixed. But anyway, <laughs> on Christmas Day, 1969, Gacy's father died from cirrhosis of the liver. Gacy was not told that his father had died until two days after his death. When he heard the news, Gacy was said to have collapsed to the floor, Damn. sobbing uncontrollably, and had to be picked up off the floor by prison See, staff. he is emotional, yeah. and he loved his dad, weirdly enough. He really it did. It like he really he sought his approval. approval from him, yeah. And the fact that he didn't get it for so long really fucking crushed him. And maybe he felt like he never got it. And he, in, well, I guess he felt like he got it at the end. So interesting. Wow. So Gacy was granted parole finally um, with 12 months probation on June 18, 1970, after serving only 18 months of his 10 year sentence. Because he was so well behaved. Because like, literally he was out. like the model prisoner. The guy. Yeah. He yeah. was like, everybody should fall with the this guards guy's. trusted him. He manipulated his way because he's like very convincing and he really does seem like a weirdly a good person. Like yeah. you get strange. Yeah. It's like a very weird vibe from him. He's a strange one for sure. But yeah, he got he got out so quick. He did only eighteen months on In a less ten than year two sentence. Years, yeah, that's that's like a that's dream crazy. come true, probably. Yeah, he was like, maybe if I act good enough. But two of the conditions that would be a mistake. Yeah, yeah, they should have never let this guy out, uh -uh. as we'll find out. But the conditions of his uh, probation were that he would have to go back to Chicago to live with his mother, and that he would have a ten p.m. curfew. And also the Iowa Board of Parole would receive regular updates as to his progress. Upon his release, Gacy told a friend and fellow JC named Clarence Lane, who picked him up from the prison upon release and had remained steadfast in his belief of Gacy's innocence, that he would never go back to jail, quote unquote, and that he intended to reestablish himself in Waterloo, Iowa. However, within 24 hours of, release, of his release, Gacy relocated to Chicago to live with his mother. And once back in Chicago, later on, he obtained a job as a cook in a restaurant until shit starts going down again. On February 12th, 1971, Gacy was charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy. The youth claimed that Gacy had lured him into his car at Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal and driven him to his home where he had attempted to force the youth into sex. The complainant was sub subsequently dismissed when the youth failed to appear in court. The Iowa Board of Parole did not learn of this incident, which obviously violated his parole and would send you back to prison 100% eight so months wait, later. He, he didn't He didn't show up for court? No. Do you think Gacy threatened him like he did with the other dude? Right, right. I think he did. I think he was like, I'll fucking kill you if, if you, you show up. tattle on me. Right. Yeah. So the boy didn't do it because... Obviously, like that would have he knew that that would land his ass back in jail. Like, yeah, obviously. Yeah, that's gonna, you know, that's a big no, no. If mm -hmm. you're on parole, clearly definitely a no, no. Yeah, which is really weird that he and he gets really lucky when it comes to the criminal justice system throughout his life. And he definitely escapes being caught and going to jail more than once. But with financial assistance from his mother, Gacy bought a house in Norwood Park Township in an unincorporated area of Cook County. The address, 8213 West Summerdale Avenue, is where he resided until his arrest in December 1978 and where all of his known murders took place. basically took place and where bodies were stored. In August 1971, shortly after Gacy and his mother moved into the house, he became engaged to Carol Hoff, a div divorcee with two young daughters. Hoff, whom he had briefly dated in high school, had been a friend of his younger sister. His fiance moved into his home soon after the couple got engaged, and Gacy's mother moved out of the house shortly before his wedding, which was held on July 1st, 1972. So he was obviously like charming enough to like yeah, romance, a, romance a woman, multiple women. Oh, yeah. 
and lore men like the fact like he yeah. clearly had this likability to him yeah, he did. that attracted people to him because like my whole thing with him during this whole his whole life is like how did people like fall for his shit like over and over, how, yeah. over, and, over and over again like he had this like weird charm about him yeah it's very weird one week before his second wedding on June 22nd, he was arrested and charged with aggravated battery and reckless conduct. The arrest was in response to a complaint filed by a youth named Jackie D who informed police that Gacy impersonating a police officer had flashed a sheriff's badge, lured him into his car and forced him to perform oral sex. God, that's so creepy. He would drive around mm -hmm. and then whenever he'd see a victim, he would put pretend lights on and pretend to be a cop. That's like really freaky. If that ever happens to you guys, cause that actually still happens sometimes. It does. Like people pretend to be cops. If you ever are unsure that it's an actual police officer behind you. I think I just saw you. something like that. Yeah. Cause yeah, normally they don't actually. look exactly like a cop, but people think it's enough to like pull over. It's just one light. But if you feel at all unsure that the person pulling you over is not a police, you can, you can call and they can like verify they can that tell, it is. They can tell you if there's a actual officer in the area and yeah. if a call for your vehicle has been called in yes right exactly because that's like the first thing that police do is when they before they pull you over they radio yeah. dispatch be like this yeah. is the car i'm pulling over right. this is where i'm at yeah yeah i actually saw there was an article Happened recently yeah somebody was driving a mustang and they put just a red light in a you know kind of like if you've ever been pulled over by an unmarked car how they have the red light and the blue light right in the front windshield and uh yeah the Mustang had had that and it actually and the person was smart and actually ended up calling the police oh, and they good. pulled the guy out and it ended up being a rapist. A guy Dude. that was like literally driving around like raping people. Good thing she called. Holy so, shit. So yeah, that person was super smart. Yeah, it used to happen a lot more. Like there's a lot of cases from like the seventies and eighties of people pretending totally. to be police. Totally. So that's that was his kind of his method uh that he used to how you lure get these individuals to trust in you. Yeah. right totally what's crazy is that even though that he did this the charges were later dropped after the complainant attempted to blackmail gacy into paying money in exchange for dropping the charges how crazy is that wait what he tried to the, pay him money to the drop person it? blackmailed gacy into paying money in exchange for dropping the charges and they found out about it so they dropped the charges anyway oh my god wow so he got away with that essentially wow. which is crazy all right, before we get into um, some of the dastardly deeds of this individual, just want to quickly thank our second sponsor, Upstart, for sponsoring today's episode. Debt. Some people have a lot, some have a little. We all have it pretty much, but the vast, uh, but the path to financial freedom can look awfully bleak when you have high interest debt. And if your FICO score isn't great, it can make breaking out of that revolving debt cycle harder than it needs to be. Thankfully, our sponsor, Upstart, is revolutionizing the process of personal lending. Upstart offers personal loans, but they're not like the ones your bank or credit union provides. That's because Upstart goes beyond the traditional FICO score when assessing your credit worthiness. Yep, they actually reward you based on your education and your job history in the form of a smarter interest rate. It only takes two minutes to go online and find out your Upstart rate. Checking your upstart rate is always free and won't affect your credit. The best part, once your loan is approved, the funds will be transferred to you the next business day, which is great. And as somebody that you know grew up on my own with not a lot of parental help, I definitely had to go the route of loans and credit cards yeah. and things like that. And when you're first starting out without a lot of credit history, it can be very hard to you know get the loan money you need without having extremely high interest rates because your credit score sucks. So this is actually a really great service that takes into account your your education and your actual job history. So if you're working and things like that, that all go, factors into your actual interest rate that they give you. So you'll actually end up getting a lower interest rate because of that. So over four or over one hundred thousand people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards, fund their wedding, or simply to make a large purchase. Now it's your turn. All you got to do is go to upstart.com/milehire to find out how low your Upstart rate is. Again, checking your rate only takes two minutes and it won't affect your actual credit. That's good. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. Go check it out now. Only takes two minutes. 
So if you're in need of a personal loan to do anything, buy anything, pay off anything, I would definitely take advantage of this service because the interest rates will likely be much lower than what you'll find at your bank or other financial institution. So that's pretty awesome. All right, back to John Wayne Gacy. So following his marriage to Carol Hoff, whose new wife and stepdaughters moved into the Summerdale Avenue house, Gacy had quit his job as a cook and started his own construction business, PDM Contractors, which stands for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. The business initially undertook minor repair work such as sign writing, pouring concrete, and redecorating, but later expanded to include projects such as interior design, remodeling, installation, assembly, and landscaping. In 1973, Gacy and a teenage employee of PDM Contractors traveled to Florida to view property Gacy had purchased. On the first night in Florida, Gacy raped the youth in their hotel room. Oh my God. As a result, this youth refused to stay in the same hotel room as Gacy yeah. and slept on the beach instead. Oh my God. That's horrible. And after they returned to Chicago, this employee actually drove to Gacy's house while he was in the yard and beat him. Really? Yeah. Straight up Af drove. After he raped him? Yes. The wow, guy that got raped went and beat, tried to like wail on Gacy. Good for him, dude. Yeah. Damn, poor guy. And <laughs> Gacy explained to his wife that the attack happened because he had refused to pay uh, the boy for his poor quality work. And I'm sure she believed yeah. him. So while living in uh, Norwood Park, he was uh, a good neighbor. He was helpful. He was active in the local community and active in Democratic Party politics, uh, also offering the labor services of his PDM employees free of charge. So that's kind of his thing, right? He kind of yeah, like covers up fake. all these things by being kind of this yeah. upstanding citizen and you know community member. Mm -hmm. So in 1975, he was appointed the director of Chicago's annual Polish Constitution Day parade. He supervised the annual event from 1975 until 1978. And through his work with the parade, Gacy actually met and took a picture with First Lady uh, Rosalind Carter. Oh, wow. On May 6, 1978. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing that picture. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So weird. A serial killer. She had no idea. With the First yeah, Lady. Yeah, she was like posed with him. Crazy. So weird. Through his membership in a local moose club, Gacy became aware of moose a club. Jolly Joker Clown Club. Okay. Whose members would regularly perform at fundraising events and parades. Oh, so that's how he's. In addition to voluntary entertaining hospitalized children. So do you think he ever actually wanted to be a clown or was it just a way to get to victims? I think he realized, I think, yeah, exactly. I, I think he would probably say like, I actually like wanted to do this because I wanted to, you know, yeah, but I, I don't know. I think, I think the real reason obviously is to get, Get Dems. near the people that he liked most, which are Kids. young boys in this yeah. uh, the story. Freaky. By late 1975, Gacy had joined the Jolly Jokers and created his own performance characters, Pogo the Clown and Patches Pogo. the Clown. Ooh. Yeah. Creepy. And Gacy designed his own costumes and taught himself how to apply clown makeup. Although some professional clowns noted the sharp corners Gacy painted at the edges of his mouth as opposed to the rounded corners that professional yeah. clowns normally employ so as to not to scare yeah, children. Yeah, it's a lot softer look, but he was aiming to scare. So when you look at pictures of him as a clown, he's freaky looking. He looks creepy, man. He looks really creepy. Yeah, like he was enjoying this. Like I sure. understand how they let Pogo or Patches the Clown uh, perform at numerous local parties, Democratic Party functions, charitable Ugh. events, and children's hospitals he was at. Oh, that's so freaky. I don't ever want to hire a clown for anything. Yeah, seriously. I don't trust clowns, man. I don't trust them one <laughs> there bit. There could be a clown out there listening. Dude, clowns are... Uh, I just don't it trust clowns. <laughs> <laughs> but some clowns are nice. Dude, he would even like get in his clown outfit and go down to like the local bar to get a drink, <laughs> which was the Good Luck Lounge. People were probably like... Homie, what are you doing? And it sounds like it wasn't even when he had an event. Like he would just dress up and as a clown and go to the bar. Nice. But he would tell people was that like I was at a charitable oh, event, yeah, but just stopping by. Didn't even bother to take my makeup off or anything before I came in. No, he's probably out looking for people. So that's just weird. And then in 1975, Gacy told his wife that he was bisexual. How did she take it? <laughs> Not good. 
because yeah. after the couple had sex on Mother's Day that year, he informed her this would be the last time they would ever have sex. What? Yeah. Wow. Mother's Day and that's it. He was like, that's it. I'm never having sex with you again. Why? Did because he, say he why? began spending most evenings away from home. With men. With men. Young boys. Wow. And would return in the early hours in the morning. And he would always use the excuse of, oh, I was just working late. Oh, my God. But his wife wasn't dumb because she saw him bringing teenage boys into his garage and also found gay pornography in his possession. And obviously she was like, what the fuck is going on here? So she divorced him in March 1976. But didn't report it. But that's the thing too is I'm like, why didn't like why weren't the police like on this dude's trail like as a I possible know. He left pedophile? So many like, like things. It's crazy. Behind. Yeah, he was messy. Yes. So this is where uh the real evil begins. On January second, nineteen seventy two, Gacy picked up sixteen year old Timothy Jack McCoy from Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal. Gacy took McCoy, who was traveling from Michigan to Omaha, on a sightseeing tour of Chicago and then drove him to his home with the promise that he could spend the night and be driven back to the station in time to catch the bus. According to Gacy's later account of this first of this murder, he awoke the following morning to find uh, the boy McCoy standing in his bedroom doorway with a kitchen knife. Gacy leaped from his bed, and McCoy raised both arms in a gesture of surrender, tilting the knife upwards and accidentally cutting Gacy's forearm, which he actually has a scar on his forearm, that supports the story. Wow. He then twisted the knife from McCoy's wrist, banged his head against his bedroom wall, kicked him against his wardrobe, and walked towards him. McCoy then kicked him in the stomach, and Gacy grabbed the boy, wrestled him to the floor, then stabbed him repeatedly in the chest as he straddled oh him with his God. body. Damn. Gacy claimed he went to his kitchen and saw an open carton of eggs and a slab of unsliced bacon on his kitchen table. McCoy had actually set the table for the both of them, and he had wow. actually been walking into Gacy's room to wake him up. Oh my God. To tell him he had breakfast made. <gasps> Whoa. So his basically his like first murder is a total mishap. Oh my God. That's crazy. The guy wasn't he, he thought it was a threat and like yeah. he's gonna which is weird. It's like yeah. what Maybe he thought because of what had happened, the fact that Why they had sexual say, relations, like, like yeah. I made breakfast. Yeah, just breakfast. Like it why? is a little weird to like walk in like, like with a knife, like arms up or however. Like, I don't know. It's just really weird. Uh, well, it must. We don't even know if we're getting the real story. Well, yeah, that's true. I I feel like there's more to that yeah. than than one is being told. Yeah, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But this is when um, McCoy was the first victim of his, in which he buried in his crawl space, and he actually later covered. Uh, McCoy's grave with a layer of concrete. In an interview after his arrest, Gacy stated that immediately after killing McCoy, he felt totally drained, yet noted that he had experienced a mind nubbing Numbing. orgasm as he Whoa. killed the boy. While he killed him? Yeah, he said, That's when Ew. I realized that death was the ultimate thrill. Oh my God, that's so freaky. So that's just like, it's like he went into this other type of, you know, Zone. It's like hide, you know, it's like yeah, he, just, hide, yeah. he goes into this evil dark side Zone. of himself. Oh, that's so creepy. Uh, Gacy also later stated that the second time he committed murder was around January 1974. The victim was believed to have been an unidentified teenage youth uh, with medium brown hair estimated to be aged between 14 and 18, whom Gacy strangled before putting his body in his closet prior to burial. Later on, Gacy talked about how fluid leaked out of his out of Ew. the boy's mouth and nose Ew. while he was stored in the closet, staining his carpet. Inconvenient. As a result of this experience, he said that from here on out, he stuffed cloth rags or the victim's own underwear in their mouth to prevent a recurrence of this incident. Gross. This unidentified victim was about 15 feet from the barbecue pit in Gacy's backyard. He's unidentified. We don't even know who he is. That's so wild. Yeah. No one like came looking for him or unidentified anything? Unidentified still. Yeah. We That's don't know so who that, that boy is. That's so sad, man. Man. So by 1975, Gacy's business is expanding rapidly. 
He said he began working 12 to 16 hour days to fulfill agreed commitments upon an increasing number of contracts. And he freely admitted that 1975 was also the year in which he began to increase the frequency of his excursions for sex with young males. He would call this cruising. He'd go cruising is what he'd say. And what really he was really crazy. doing was like he was stalking. looking for victims and young men only. He did not his the only ones he ever messed with were young men from like like teenage men for, I think for the most part which is just so weird and so sick. Yeah. But much of the uh workforce of his PDM contractor contractors consist of high school students and young men conveniently. One of these young men was 15 year old Anthony Ant Antonucci who Gacy had hired in May 1975. In July 1975 Gacy arrived at the boy's home while the boy was home alone. Having injured his foot at work the prior day Gacy tempted the boy with alcohol and then wrestled him to the floor and cuffed Antonucci's hands behind his back. And that was that. So his whole method to his um, to all of his murders, for the most part, is somehow luring the victim in, subduing them with handcuffs, and then he would essentially uh, proceed to strangle most of them. But in, in Antonucci's case, uh, the cuff actually on one of his right wrists was loose, and he was able to free his arm from the handcuff after Gacy left the room. When Gacy returned. Antonucci, who was a member of the high school wrestling team, pounced on him. Wow. And the boy wrestled Gacy to the floor, obtained possession of the handcuff key, and then cuffed Gacy's hands behind his back. Oh, damn. Good for him. Gacy screamed threats, but then calmed down and promised to leave if Antonucci removed the handcuffs. The boy agreed, and Gacy left the house. Wow. He's lucky he actually left. Yeah. Antonucci later recalled that Gacy had told him as he lay on the floor, not only are you the one who got out of the cuffs, you got them on me. That's so creepy. What? What does that mean? Not only are you the one who got out of the cuffs, so that you got them on he me. He obviously had a lot of experience doing this same thing. Yeah. Oof. One week after this attempted assault on Antonucci on July 29, 1975, another of Gacy's employees, 17 year old John Bukovic, disappeared. The day before his disappearance, Bukovic had threatened Gacy over two weeks' outstanding back pay. Gacy later admitted to luring Bukovic to his home while his wife and stepchildren were visiting his sister in Arkansas in order to settle the issue of this overdue wages. Gacy conned the youth into allowing his wrist to be cuffed behind his back, at which point Gacy strangled him to death and buried his body under the concrete floor of his garage. It's so weird how it seems like a lot of his killings were like really fast and like well, I don't understand. No, it's like if it's you enjoy not, Oh, not all of them. Okay. He later said, I sat on the kid's chest for a while before killing him. Okay. Well. Bukovic's uh Dodge Sedan was found abandoned in a parking lot with with the boys' wallet inside and the keys in the ignition. Terrible, dude. His father, Bukovic's father, actually called Gacy, who claimed he was happy to help search for the boy. Of course. And was sorry that the boy had run away. Oh, my God. It's Gacy so was freaky. obviously questioned about his disappearance and admitted that the boy and two friends had come over. And over the following three years, Bukovic's parents called the police more than 100 times, urging them to investigate Gacy further. So basically, Gacy was like, yeah, they came over. It was him and his friends, but you know we reached a compromise, and he was all good, and then he left, and I I know nothing else basically. And his parents are like, "That's bullshit." And his yeah, his parents were like, no. "Dude, he you were the last person he was with." Like, yeah, the fu this doesn't make sense. And he was like angry with you, and he he just like vanished in thin air. There's no yeah. trace of him. What something's up. And what's crazy about about the investigation into Gacy is like there isn't one for mm -hmm. so long, like. Nobody takes him seriously as a possible like yeah. child snatcher mm -hmm. and killer. Like he's like not on their ra police radar at all. It's crazy. Mm -mm. So this this idea of luring young boys and then donning handcuffs basically became his mo mm -hmm. when subduing his victims. That's like what he did. Mm -hmm. He would tempt young boys with drinks, drugs, and basically just gaining their trust. And then he would produce the handcuffs 
sometimes as a part of a clowning routine, which is creepy. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I wonder if he ever wore the clown suit. I think he and did. Acted like I think he did. Absolutely. Because he probably knew that would freak people out. That would be so horrifying. Yeah, absolutely. So when his, I'm sure he got like, you know, some something out of the fear that he saw in people. It seems like he liked a lot liked of serial control, killers like the to control fear. over yeah. them. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. I think it kind of was like I think for him it it became a way to sort of deal with this trauma from his childhood of his father yeah. beating him and now he can be in the yep. the power position. Yes, totally. Yeah. That's yeah. like I think that's pretty I think a psychologist would agree that probably. You know, he wants to have that power on he, someone else. He's wanting to have that over someone else yeah. cuz he experienced that. So he wants to be on the other side of the table. Yeah, it makes sense. So once he'd get his victim handcuffed and unable to free himself, Gacy would then make a statement to the effect of, the trick is you have to have the key. Oh, yeah, because he would be like, check out this trick yeah. I can do. But yeah. then the trick is you're yeah. locked in it. There's not yeah. a trick. It's, like, a, an act, it's a trick. You ha I have <laughs> the key, basically. Like, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah. And then he would rape and torture them. God, so scary. Dude. He called it the rope trick. God. Which is where he would place a rope over his victim's neck, tying a makeshift tourniquet until the victim was strangled to death. So basically, oh my God. he learned in Boy Scouts as a kid to uh, tie a tourniquet knot, which is like two knots, and then you basically, um, you tie into a rope, and then you put a piece of wood or something, or a pen or anything yeah. into it, and then you just twist, twist it, it. Like, and it tightens the... a garage. Yeah, it tightens the actual knots, or it tightens yeah. the, the loop around whatever it's uh, tied around. So That's what John Benet Ramsey had around her neck. Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. So following a heated argument um, regarding a failing to balance a PDM contractor's checkbook correctly in October 1975, Carol Gacy asked her husband for a divorce. Gacy agreed to his wife's request, although by mutual consent, Carol continued to live at 8213 West Summerdale until February 1976 when she and her daughters moved into their own apartment. What's fucking crazy about that is that they were living there when there was dead oh, my dead God. boys under the yeah they under didn't the house. even know they didn't even know what was oh, going on that's, that's oh that'd just be that'd be the freakiest thing ever yeah. or that there was literally like a dead boy in the cl mm. his closet mm -hmm. at one point like the fuck yeah that would give you nightmares that's for sure so he got divorced again on the <laughs> on the grounds of infidelity with women is what what they went with that he was okay. like cheating on his wife with women clarify that it's women yeah <laughs> but uh he was he was pretty smart in the sense that he remains like you know looked pretty good in the public eye and civic minded and um although several neighbors did start becoming aware to erratic changes in his behavior after his divorce in 1976 up until his arrest in december 1978 hmm. the behavior included hearing his car arrive and depart in the early hours of the morning noting lights switching on and off in his home at odd hours and his, you know, keeping company with young boys. Yeah, like why are yeah. all these guys here? Like if you were seeing that, you'd I would start wondering too what the fuck's going on. That's so yeah, weird. Yeah, come on. That's so Yeah, freaky. come on. Like you're not, you're not noticing anything? Did they call the police, any of them? That's the thing. Probably not. Nobody seemed to think like maybe we should have this guy investigated or, yeah. you know, like a police officer should like fucking go Go in see what house. he's up to yeah yeah that's what's so crazy about this one neighbor would later recollect that for several years she and her son had been repeatedly been awoken by repeated sounds of muffled screaming shouting and crying and they never called in the, the early morning hours which she and her son had identified as coming from a house adjacent to theirs on Somerdale Avenue so I don't oh, think they oh can say God. exactly who's coming from his house but clearly it, it probably was. was coming from his house yeah. yeah wow so they never called police yeah. Of course. So the majority of his 33 murders were committed between 1976 and 1978, which he later referred to as his cruising years. Yeah, because he that was like when he picked them up. Yeah, and this was when he had the house to himself, so it like yeah. gave him freedom to do whatever he wanted. Yeah, so he was just like living out like his free crazy rain. fuck dreams. Yeah. Literally one month after his divorce was finalized, he abducted and murdered an 18-year-old uh, young boy named Daryl Sampson. Oh. 
Samson was last seen alive in Chicago on April 6, 1976. He then just went crazy. May 14th, 15-year-old named Randall Raffelt disappeared while walking home. Uh, he died from asphyxiation. Jeez. Hours after he had been inducted, a 14-year-old named Samuel Stapleton vanished as he walked to his home from his sister's apartment. Both of these boys were buried in the same grave in the crawl space. And then in June 3rd, 1976, Gacy killed a 17-year-old uh, boy named Michael Bonin. He disappeared while traveling from Chicago to Waukegan, was strangled with a ligature and buried in his crawl space. Damn. 16-year-old William Carroll, buried underneath Gacy's kitchen. Oh, my God. He was the first of four males known to have been murdered between June 13th and August 6th, 1976. So literally, it was his cruising years. He was just going nuts. Yeah. Just he living had, it up. He literally had nothing to worry about. Like mm -hmm. he could go out and and basically abduct these young men and bring them back to his house and do his sick games and murder them. Wow. The three identified youths uh, that were murdered between June thirteenth and August sixth were aged between sixteen and seventeen years old. I can't believe they're unidentified still. That's too wild. Yeah. The only unidentified male known to have been murdered between these dates is a man with medium dark brown hair estimated to have been aged between 23 and 30 years old. And no one claimed him or knew who he was. Mm -mm. This man had two missing upper front teeth at the time mm. of his disappearance, leading investigators to believe this particular victim most likely wore a denture. Interesting. And what's crazy is that Gacy would literally like just start piling bodies up in his crawl space. Yeah, I can't believe that. And then his excuses for the smell. Yeah. Like he tried saying it was like cat pee and stuff. Yeah, when like they were his like dog, his questioning the smell in his house. Yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, it's just little puppy piddles, you know, and smells. No, dude. Yeah, this guy got a lot of nerve. He, he got had crazy. A lot I mean, there's, nerve. there's, you know, there's 33 victims here. So. I mean, I don't, I don't particularly want to go through each of their no, deaths because they're, no. it's extremely sad, <laughs> extremely sad, and and this guy just was ruthless. Gacy yeah. just would abduct them and even abduct two out of two of them at a time. Yeah, literally would just pull up to them, grab them both, and he'd use chloroform rags mm -hmm. to Put subdue it them. Their face, yeah, and then basically handcuff them and do the ligature thing and have you know have them perform sexual acts or. Like he would stuff things up their cavities and like he was just crazy, man. God. But um, let's jump ahead to 1977. Uh, John Sue, uh, so a 19-year-old acquaintance of uh, Bukov Bukovic, actually. Um, was this like the first guy, right? Yeah, he was uh, friends with uh, Bukovic, one of the first guys. Mm -hmm. But Sue was lured to Gacy's house on the pretext of selling his Plymouth satellite to Gacy. He ended up being buried in, in Gacy's crawl space directly <sighs> above the body of the others. A ring worn by, uh, so which bore his initials, was retained in a dresser in Gacy's master bedroom. He also kept the portable Motorola TV in his bedroom and later sold the boy's car to uh, a man named Michael Rossi. And so all the way up until 1978, he just continues to take 20 year old, you know, he. Basically anybody he could he could find yeah. that fit his you know yeah, what fantasy. he was into, mm -hmm. and a lot of them worked for his company, which is just crazy. Like, how did people not realize that like, like these people on. were disappearing? Yeah, they're like, oh, this guy's missing, and this guy's missing, and this guy's missing. Like, you'd think you'd start to be like, what is the one connection between all of these people? But you know, in hindsight, everything's twenty twenty, right? <laughs> yeah. So things started, started, they started kind of figuring out and, and getting suspicious of Gacy uh, when it came to So's car. Because the person who bought it, Michael Rossi, was arrested actually for stealing gasoline from a service station while driving that particular car. The attendant noted the license plate number and police actually traced the car to Gacy's house. Rossi had actually lived with Gacy until April 1977 and had worked for his contractor's company since 1976. When questioned, Gacy told officers that So had sold the car to him in February with the explanation that he needed money to leave town. The police did not pursue the matter further, although they did inform Sue's mother or So's mother that her son had sold his car to Gacy. 
And this motherfucker, after he's killed all these young men, began dating Carol Hoff in the hope of reconciliation. So the, oh the gr- woman he had gotten divorced to, he yeah. went back to her. And she took him back? Yeah. Well, well she they started yeah. kind of dating, yeah. But at this point, he's murdered an additional six young men between the oh ages of 16 and 21. God. So, and his excuse, you know, whenever questioned by this was that he was so busy with his job because he was really busy with his job and that he couldn't have been in all these different places where these boys went missing and things like that when they did. But they, he could have been though. Right. Well, that's the thing. He, and he always like his excuses for it. It's just so amazing how he like truly believes it. He's like, yeah, there's no way I could have. Well, what's really interesting about this is that for some of these murders, it's, um, a lot of people think that he may not have acted alone in some of them. Interesting. That he may actually have had help from somebody close to him Mm -hmm. with the abductions of some of these individuals. Especially like the two guys. I would think it'd be really hard to That's what I'm take saying. two like, guys off the street. This guy isn't like the Hulk or anything. He's like this like chubby, overweight yeah. guy. Kind of that, loser looking clown. He's literally a clown. Like literally, he was able to overpower two like young. Like these are teenagers all the way up to yeah. 20 year olds. Yeah, like, that seems really They're not hard able to, do. to like fight him off or anything. And I mean, yeah. obviously he had the chloroform. So he like, you know, went with that right away. But mm-hmm. honestly, I think it's very possible he had help. Yeah, for with, sure. With some of these abductions, for sure. I think sure. so. Yeah. I wonder who it is. And like bringing these bo- various bodies down to his uh, crawl space, like yeah. they're heavy. Like what yeah. the hell? How is yeah. he doing this? He even he even uh, abducted and murdered a 19-year-old U.S. Marine. Oh, wow. Who disappeared after leaving his mother's house. He was actually, he was strangled to death and buried in the northwest corner of the crawl space. Oh, my God. So it's getting into October, into December, and he's still just abducting these young men and murdering them. And one in particular in December 30th of 1977 was a 19 year old student named Robert Donnelly, uh, who he um, abducted from a Chicago bus stop at gunpoint. Gacy drove Donnelly home with him, raped him, tortured him with various devices and repeatedly dunked his head into a bathtub filled with water until he passed out. And oh, then that's so sad. And then revived him though. Oh my God. Donnelly later that. actually survived this and later testified at Gacy's trial that he was in so much pain that he asked Gacy to kill him to get it over with. Oh, so sad, to which dude. Gacy said to him, I'm getting around to it. Oh my God. That's so freaky. That poor guy. How'd he get out? Well, after after literally assaulting and torturing him for several hours, Gacy actually drove uh, Donnelly to his place of work, removed the handcuffs from his wrists, and released him. Wow, that was weird. And Why'd he, he do obviously that? reported the assault, and police actually questioned Gacy about it on January 6, nineteen seventy eight, in which Gacy admitted to having had slave sex with Donnelly, but insisted what? everything was consensual. And the police what? actually fucking believed him. What? And they never filed charges about this. That's oh, what's so crazy is the police just like did God. not investigate him. They dropped him. the ball. They could have prevented a lot. They dropped the ball big time over and oh, over man. and over again. Then he, yeah. Like the fact that all of these young men are all mysteriously disappearing from one area. Like nowadays I think I feel like police would be smart enough to connect some dots here and be like yeah. what the fuck. Like yeah. all the circumstances are the same. And now these boys are like literally been like this guy fucking abducted me yeah. and this is what he did to and me they didn't and even, not yeah. think like, oh, he's telling me maybe why would this someone guy's make it the up? fucking serial killer we've yeah. been looking for. Oh my God, dude. These it's police baffling. in this department, whatever, whoever was on this guy was not thinking. So, I mean, I get it's like, you know, the late seventies, but like, but I feel still, like that's this is just dumb. like complete negligence on the, yeah. on the, you know, the police is for sure, but it shows what a manipulator he was, dude. He was able to convince anyone of anything. He really was. He really was. He absolutely was a master manipulator. Yeah. So the police believed him. Mm-hmm. Didn't have any charges filed. And then the next month he killed a 19 year old. Oh my God. Uh, geez, they could have prevented that. His name was William Kendron and he was the final victim to be buried in Gacy's crawl space. Damn. And after his crawl space got filled up, he thought, hmm, where do I put my victims now? I've, yeah. My crawl space is full. 
Mm-hmm. So, so he thought about, well, maybe I'll do it, put them in my attic. But then he was like, uh, the smell's going to yeah. get too crazy. Yeah. So then he started disposing of his victims in uh, the Des Plaines River. Mm-hmm. And this uh, leads us up to the story of Jeffrey Ringnall, who yeah. in March 1978, Gacy lured him, he was 26 years old at the time, into his car. Upon getting into the car, the young man was chloroformed and driven to the house on Somerdale where he was raped, tortured with various instruments, including lit candles and whips, yeah. and repeatedly chloroformed into unconsciousness. Oh, good. And then the guy was driven to the Lincoln Park where he was dumped, un- unconscious but alive, and he was eventually able to stagger to his girlfriend's apartment. He was later informed that the chloroform had permanently damaged his liver. Police were again informed of the assault, but did not investigate Gacy. What on earth? I'm starting to think that there's like some inside like thing with, yeah. with the police department. Why now. wouldn't they want to catch a killer? Like that makes them look good. Seriously. This is so strange. It's really weird. Like, was he really that big of like a civic figure that. Or maybe he was that good of a manipulator. Was, I don't know. Like he must have had some ties or maybe. For all we know, there could be police corruption. He could have been paying him off. Yeah, he could have been. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, he was a pretty big, like, public figure and stuff. Yeah. Maybe there are some weird under the table Maybe. deals going on or something. God, but I don't know. From I don't know. That's pretty negligent. How mm-hmm. long can you get away with like helping someone with that? I don't know. I don't know, man. I just don't get how he was able to get away with all this shit without yeah. any police for so long, like investigation. Yeah. yeah. Especially since people, multiple people reported him. It's really weird. <sighs> the fuck? It's just ridiculous. Yeah. But this uh, Rignall guy, after this assault and attack, he was able to recall that on that night that he was literally in this chloroform haze, he remembered Gacy's distinctive black Oldsmobile, as well as the Kennedy Expressway and some side streets. He actually staked out the exit on the expressway where he knew he had been driven until in April, he saw Gacy's distinctive black Oldsmobile, which Rignall and his friends followed to 8213 West Somerdale. So he didn't even know who Gacy was like on a personal level. So um, he didn't even know who he was. Like he didn't know that he was a serial killer or anything. Yeah. Um, so police issued a uh, arrest warrant and Gacy was arrested on July 15th and he was facing an impending trial for a battery charge for the original incident when he was arrested in December for the murders. All right, let's talk about how he his killing spree comes to an end. Yeah, this is so interesting. So obviously as a serial killer, it becomes very difficult to keep up, especially the pace that he was on, you know, yeah. people going missing and, mm-hmm. and being murdered every month, multiple. Yeah. So obviously, you know, they're going to make a mistake at some point or some type of careless move, which is going to lead to them being captured. And that's pretty much what happened because um, at a visit to a local pharmacy, Gacy offered 15 year old Robert Peast a job that paid better than his current job at the pharmacy. Peast informed his mother of the job offer and headed off to meet Gacy. When Peace failed it's to return home. good thing he home. told his mom. Yeah, no, I know. that This guy was actually um, pretty smart. Yeah, he was. Because he told his mother, and his mother actually filed a missing person report, mm-hmm. which I'm like, nobody else did that? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. But Gacy denied meeting with Peace. However, he was seen at the pharmacy offering Peace a job by more than one witness. Mm-hmm. And this Peace investigation led to Rignall's tale yeah. of Gacy's violence as well as other witnesses to Gacy's actions. At this point in time, finally, he is put under around the clock surveillance by the police. Yeah, because people were starting to come like forward and like they're connecting the dots. They're like, wait, this person is missing and is connected to him. This person worked for him. Maybe we should be watching this guy. Yeah. See where he's going, what he's up to. So they started doing that. But that did not scare Gacy at first. He actually grew so comfortable with the surveillance teams that he actually turned it into a game. Wow. And this is what he said. He even offered them breakfast at one point. So I'm like, well, first of all, if, you, if you're doing he police surveillance crazy. on somebody, you would think that you would not be seen. Like these guys were just like, sit, I could just imagine like they're sitting outside in their black SUV yeah. or something. And or black. he just goes out there and he's like, yo, you want breakfast? He's like, hey, you want breakfast? And then he even went as far to tell the detectives over breakfast. So they obviously had breakfast together. 
you know, clowns can get away with murder. <laughs> Quote unquote. What, That's what he the said. fuck? Dude, this guy was off his rocker. So police are obviously like, what the fuck? This is crazy. Things are starting to make sense. So they did their first search. Their first search warrant was issued. And really nothing notable was found at first. But however, that all changed during the second search warrant in which a detective noticed a smell coming from the air ducts that could have been the smell of rotting corpses. Dude, I bet it was rank. I bet it was so bad. And like in you just walls. said, he tried to play it off as like, oh, my puppy just peed on the newspaper and, you know, in a small yeah, room right, with the heat dude. on. No. Uh, yeah, he's like the heat Rotting, made it bad. Any police officer will tell you that's ever yeah. been around a decaying dead body that it smells like something you would never, nothing else. Like dead bodies just smell very unique and very bad. So <laughs> the fact that he was like, Oh, yeah, it's just, you know, piss heating up is what you're smelling. Yeah. This guy was had a lot of nerve. So obviously he's he's feeling the heat. And on the evening of December 20th, Gacy drove to his lawyer's office in Park Ridge to attend a pre-scheduled meeting he had arranged with them to discuss the progress of his civil suit. And upon his arrival, he appeared disheveled and immediately asked for an alcoholic drink where his lawyer fetched a bottle of whiskey from his car and upon his return, he asked Gacy what he had to discuss with him. And this is when Gacy picked up a copy of the newspaper from his desk and pointed to a front page article covering the disappearance of Robert Peace and informed his lawyers, this boy is dead. He's in the river. Yeah. So over the following hours, he went on to give a rambling confession that ran into the early hours of the following morning. He informed his lawyers that he had been the judge, jury, and executioner of many, many people. Yeah. Most of whom he stated were buried in his crawl space and others in the Des Plaines River. Some of the victims he referred to by name, but most he dismissed as male prostitutes, hustlers, and liars, whom he would yeah. give the rope trick. That was so what was so weird about it too is like he totally like dehumanized his victims and would literally be like they came looking for love in the wrong places and they were kind of like they got what male they prostitute, got what they deserve. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, kind of like I was doing a almost like doing a justice f to them or for them for society almost like trying to like rationalize his actions. Mm -hmm. In reference to Robert Peace, Gacy say that he was placed the tourniquet around his neck and that Peace was crying and scared. And after that, he fell asleep due to the alcohol he consumed until the very next morning in which he had a psychiatric appointment at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Ignoring his lawyer's advice regarding this scheduled appointment, Gacy left their office to attend to the needs of his business. And upon leaving his lawyer's office, Gacy drove to a Shell gas station where in the course of filling his rental car, he handed a small bag of weed to the attendant, a young boy named Lance Jacobson. Jacobson immediately handed the bag to the surveillance officers and adding that Gacy had told him the end is coming for him, for the boy. These oh. guys are going to kill me. Gacy then drove to the home of a fellow contractor, Ronald Road. Inside Road's living room, Gacy hugged Road before bursting into tears and saying, I killed 30 people, give or take a few. After that, the surveillance officers noted that he was holding a rosary as he drove on the expressway after he left his house holding it to his chin, praying while driving. So interesting how he was religious. So ultimately, they take him down for like a drug charge. That's how they arrest him. Yeah. And once they arrest him, the police then go back to uh, the house for the uh, second search warrant. And the because now they have a direct connection between him and Ro Robert Peast. Yeah. And so at this point, this is when... So Robert um, Peast really led to... Them yeah, finding out about absolutely. the rest of it. It was all Robert Peace. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So they they actually they arrested him for the uh, possession and distribution of marijuana in order to hold him in custody. Mm -hmm. And then on 4.30 on the afternoon, December 21st, they got the second search warrant granted. So armed with the search warrant, uh, the police and evidence technicians quickly drove to Gacy's home. Upon their arrival, officers found that Gacy had unplugged his sump pump and that the crawl space was flooded with water. That was probably on purpose too, I guarantee you, to try to destroy evidence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Make it hard for them to, you know, excavate it. 
So they had to basically turn it back on and wait for all the water to drain. And after it had done so, Ugh. an evidence technician named, oh, fuck. An evidence technician named, what's his name? Hang on. Sorry, I just lost my spot here. Okay. These people, though, had to did, had the grossest job, dude. These evidence technicians. Oh, I know. Because I can't even imagine it was like this going muddy, into a crawl space. It was like this muddy water area where all these bodies were. Like, can you imagine how dirty it kept filling with water? They were saying it was just like completely nasty. Yeah. He, well, he goes in there and he's like, he goes in there and starts digging around, doesn't see anything at first. But then he literally says to everybody shouting to the rest of the investigators that, that they were there, that they could charge Gacy with murder because he said, I think this place is full of kids. Wow. So at this point, Gacy returns to his house on December 22nd with the police to show them the location in his garage where he had buried Bukovic's body. He then took him to the spot by the river where he had thrown Peace and the other victims in. Mm -hmm. and, only, and he was like the last one they found too. Yeah, yeah. Only four of the five victims Gacy claimed to have disposed of in this way were ever recovered from the Dust Plains River. Between 1978 and 1979, the total number of bodies exhumed at 8213 West Summerdale Avenue, so his house, was 29 bodies. That's so much. That's really crazy. And they were all in advanced state of decomposition, obviously. Oh, yeah. They couldn't even like really identify them based upon their actual bodies they had to use um dental records oh, to yeah. identify many of the victims yeah. and luckily i mean i look the first thing i did when i found his address is i googled it i'm like i wonder if the house is still there yeah. it's not there's another house that was built yeah on it they Good. they demolished that house uh in 1979 Even being on that land would be freaky yeah so as far as his trial goes he went to trial on february 6 1980 he was charged with the murder of 30 33 young men and his defense basically entered a not guilty by reasons of insanity plea. And basically, they also tried to make the point as well that all of these deaths were like consensual sexual experiences that went yeah. wrong due to asphyxiation, you know, like how that could be he like. He tried a, to put a twist on everything, like make it seem like it wasn't as bad. Because he really seemed like he wanted to come across as a good person. Like even in jail, he was. Mm -hmm. trying to be he was very um what's the word like i don't know he pretty, seemed like he always like made the best of his situation yeah. too like even in jail he just like well it seemed out, like he did better in jail they yeah were saying, he did it had like well, structure. He had structure and he, he didn't have the freedom to just go fulfill all of his sick fantasies you know mm -hmm. and uh, obviously with the plea of ins insanity like he had to be screened by psychiatrists and um, they found Gacy to be suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, the defense uh, psychiatrist did, so I don't know if he for sure had that. But the prosecution claimed that the premeditation of Gacy's crimes proved he was in the right mind at the time he committed his, mur uh, committed his crimes. And I, I have to agree. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's all clearly planned out. I think it's even more planned out than we even know, yeah. like than he will ever he ever admitted or anything like that. Yeah. Um, because clearly he had all these things in place and but something's clearly wrong with him mentally too it's such a hard topic yeah like debate. well yeah something's obviously clearly yeah i mean he had a traumatic childhood and stuff but i don't know if i would say he was like necessarily like mentally ill like it seemed like he really knew what he was doing like and well that, i mean don't you think you'd have to be a little mentally ill to commit that many murders and like hide bodies in your house like i think you're not just like normal yeah uh, <laughs> that's pretty fucking weird I don't it is know. but but i'm not I, but saying I think people people are will do sick things to yeah. especially fulfill sexual fantasies I yeah do. it seemed like well it's interesting because it seems with serial killers they're either on the sexual side or the killing side because yeah. the ones that like to kill do, do way like more crazy. intense things yeah, than yeah, yeah. he did right. and versus he, just like yeah he just ended people's lives pretty quickly right it's not like he was like chopping people up yeah. or like really or enjoying like it enjoying like blood no or he just like had that. to get rid of them once he used them because they would tell on him that's what it seemed like so i think he definitely knew what he was doing for I sure i do too I, I think i think he had i think he definitely got like a a thrill rush adrenaline when he did do these things and you know i i think he did get some sick satisfaction from killing these young men but i think the main thing for him was the sexual aspect yeah, of it I agree. for sure i agree 
totally agree. So he was, um, the jury deliberated for less than two hours and they found him guilty of the 33 murders, sexual assault and indecent liberties of a child. And they came back with 12 death sentences as well as an execution date, which would be carried out on June 2nd, 1980. So during his stint until his death, he actually spent 14 years in jail on death row at Menard Correctional Center in Chester, Illinois. And what's so crazy and weird and just goes to speak to is like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Like Mr. Hyde, the whole thing is like he completely like was like, I didn't kill these kids. He actually said that he was just like a running a funeral home for these young men for some for other killers yeah. that were out there. Dude, which is he was, fucking crazy. Yeah. But did he really think that? But that's the thing, is like maybe he somehow like did not think he actually I don't know. Like that's so clearly, crazy. Because most serial killers are proud of it, especially once they're caught and they know it's over and you've got the death sentence. Like but he was he was like talking about how he was an innocent man that was being put to death. Yeah. Right up until then. Yeah, you can actually go on YouTube and watch his interviews mm -hmm. that he gives with the local news there and they're like asking him about stuff and like and he literally is like Yeah, I didn't kill these kids. And yep. Because the the interviewers actually compare him to like Jeffrey Dahmer and things yeah, like and that. He's like, and he's don't like, Don't put do me that. In that. And he would he would blame the victims, in fact. Mm -hmm. He was like basically saying they asked if they had been they out were there, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have been killed yeah. and all, that all this crazy shit. Victim blaming mindset. And he even at one point calls himself a loving father, unable to ever hit his children, who had yeah. also a father who was complete opposite of his own. Yeah, he was just crazy. So weird. And then so he did artwork too. He like made all this creepy art. Yeah, thirty three like flavors clown, creepy, <laughs> creepy as hell. He drew pictures of clowns, and he did like this one that is a uh, like a skull with a bunch sex of skull is what it's called. Oof, it's like freaky phallic symbols and naked bodies of both men and women yeah and then he did these seven dwarfs paintings uh, with a clown yeah it's really creepy um and then he was finally put to death wasn't he yes he was so he eventually ran out of appeals and was actually put to death by lethal injection on may 9th 1994 his last meal was made up of a bucket of kfc chicken fried shrimp Fitting. strawberries french fries and a diet coke interesting i always want to know what people's last meal is how horses weird. would be fucking kfc and then what was so interesting about it is after they killed him they had like a bunch of people that were victims of him or related to victims uh get to burn his artwork outside yeah yeah his big fire pit that was really interesting to me and his artwork actually became like worth a lot of money too which is interesting well yeah i mean he's kind of famous now weirdly enough a lot of these killers end up being But literally, famous. yeah, but literally like all the way up to the moment for death, his last words were kiss my ass. <laughs> wow. Literally no, um, some, yeah, some serial killers express emotion or regret at the end, but um, John Wayne Gacy did not show any emotion Because he was sticking with regret. I'm I'm innocent. Yeah. He was like, I didn't do it. I and just had the bodies. And he might really think that. That's what's so weird is like the way he was talking almost had me thinking this dude really doesn't think he did anything. Like he's like that his he's confused or something because yeah, he would not fess up and he's like, you're going to be killing an innocent man. He was so sure of himself. He was, so confident. he was so sure of himself. So, very interesting. It's guy, crazy. Sure. It's absolutely crazy. And yeah, six victims remain unidentified even to this day. 20. That's really sad. Cause you think like no one was there to like figure out who they were and no one cared to like, yeah, Ugh, that's sad. And I mean, what's interesting too is like, they did obviously a lot of movies based upon mm -hmm. him to catch a killer Gacy doctor or dear Mr. Gacy and some even rumor that he's in uh, kind of been some of the inspiration for the Pennywise clown in uh, Stephen King's it That's kind of weird though. I feel like if maybe he was out more like creeping in his clown suit maybe but yeah, he reminds me of did you ever see the Rob Zombie movie? Probably not. Devil's mm -hmm. Rejects? No. Don't ever watch it. Or House of a Thousand Corpses or anything? Nope. Yeah, I watched not a bunch of those Rob Zombie anything. movies, which are fucking scary as hell. And in Devil's Rejects, there's a clown, which just reminds me. He, he like, wears his clown makeup everywhere, and he, like, like abducts people and does fucked up shit. And, like, it reminds me of, of Gacy. But it's absolutely crazy. But the last two things I just wanted to mention was that in 2012, actually, two Chicago lawyers... Um, reviewed archive records relating to Gacy's business travels for both his companies and said that it is likely 
that Gacy may have been assisted by one or more accomplices in a minimum of three murders. Mm, that makes sense. So there could be people out there that could be responsible for I some of these murders or uh, were accomplices, wow. which is crazy. Yeah, and they just and got totally away with possible. it. possible. That's crazy. Maybe we'll figure out who it is. Some have even theorized that he, Gacy was connected with a Chicago-based sex trafficking ring known as the Delta Project. Oh, my God. That is so creepy. Like, what if he was somehow in cahoots he with the totally sex trafficking ring? Been. He'd be the type. I mean, he would be the type. Maybe he ran it for all we know. I mean, I, I think he went to his grave with a lot of secrets and a lot of things that he didn't tell anybody. Yeah. I, yeah. I think there's a lot more to the story than well, what clearly. we Well, clearly. We're getting, like, bits and pieces of it, and he's not going to tell us he's the not truth. Tell us he lied to the, everyone his whole life. So. He's not going to tell us all, you know. I don't even think he knows, to be honest. I think he, like, has blocked. Like, I'm sure... Some of those things were so brutal that you could mentally block some of them out. Like, I wonder how much even, of it like, he even like it. knows about. Yeah. Because it just really seemed like he was so sure that he didn't do it. Like, I really, really wondered if maybe he thinks he really thinks I he mean, did it. I mean, maybe he like got drugged up when he was doing this stuff. Like, maybe he like gave himself, himself some like crazy drugs and then, you know, it maybe didn't make him remember things or made him more violent or strong. Like, or he just PCP is like the type of like, person that can lie like that with no... I don't know. It's interesting for sure. I just think it's crazy that he murdered this many young men, aged, yeah. you know, in their 20s and yeah. without any of them ever like really attacking him or overtaking him or overpowering yeah. him. Like that's, that's surprising. Crazy. Like well, how do he we know? obviously like, got into positions of trust with them and and they were uncomfortable and vulnerable and surprised. So that's how he did it. I don't know, but I want to know what you guys think about this and what your, you know, if you have any other theories about him or, you know, any other rumors you heard about him because, yeah. you know, this guy is really interesting and, you know, obviously, you know, rest in peace to all of his victims. Yes, and, absolutely. God, you know, brutal, what a horrible man. way to die at yeah. the hands of a serial killer. I think that's all of our worst nightmare mm -hmm. is, you know, mm -hmm. that happening to us and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously... You know, don't go anywhere walking alone. Mm -hmm. Like this shit still happens be today. Safe. Don't trust strangers. Don't be lured. People in are by smarter things. now, though. Yeah, it's you true. Know, it's People harder to pull this kind of stuff off. You know. Yeah, somebody was you don't like, hear about "Hey, these you as want often. some drugs and alcohol? Come yeah. here. Come get in my car with me." Well, I mean, some people are. Some yeah, people some are people still it, fall but... for that, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, I think this there can be lessons taken from this that we can all learn from, and you know, if you see something suspicious, say something about it. Like. <laughs> If you notice weird things happening around you, be cautious, be, you know, observant. But yeah, I think we'll wrap it up here for today, guys. Thank you guys for enjoying, or <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this yeah, episode. But hopefully you're not too scared. Thank you for uh, joining us for episode 39, John Wayne Gacy, uh, the killer clown, serial killer. If you enjoyed this episode, if you're listening, subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us a rating and review. We'd really appreciate it. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button and make sure to subscribe for future episodes because next week should we tell them sure next week we are diving into all of the stories and legends around skinwalker ranch i know nothing about it oh get ready, ready. it's gonna be good lots of interesting shit. but thanks again for joining us yes stay safe and stay woke see you next time